as I have said, or as mentioned by the previous speaker, traditionally, immune thrombocytopenia is thought to be a disease characterized by accelerated destruction of platelets by the antiplatelet antibodies. Treatment is therefore directed primarily at reducing destruction of the antibody coated platelets. And as mentioned, unfortunately, many of the treatment options that we have available are like the many measures that many countries used to handle the economic crisis. They are either ineffective or have only a temporary effect. For example, during an economic crisis, some countries like Greece or the UK, they may try to cut the budget, they try to cut jobs, cut social benefits. Similarly, in ITP, some of us may cut out the patient's spleen. Just like most people do not like having their jobs, social benefits cut, many of the patients are very reluctant to have their spleen taken out. Other measures like IVIG immunosuppressive therapy are like quantitative easing. They are very costly and have only a temporary effect. The best way to stimulate the economy actually may be to stimulate production, to create jobs. And as mentioned before, serum from reporting level are inappropriately low in many patients with ITP. Therefore, stimulation of platelet production by thromboprotein receptor agonist may be a useful measure in patients that have chronic or refractory ITP. One such agent is atrompopec or Revolate. It is a small molecule non-peptide thromboprotein receptor agonist. And in volunteers, it has been shown to show those dependent increases in normal functioning platelets. But on the other hand, it does not cause platelet activation. Unlike the native thromboportin, which will bind to the extracellular region of the thromboportin receptor, l pack will bind to the transmembrane region. But after binding, like the native thromboportin, it will also activate the intracellular pathway, the JAK gene, etc., and resulting in increased platelet production. Numerous clinical trials have been conducted to evaluate the safety and efficacy of l pack in patients with chronic ITP. They are phase one, phase two, phase three, and extended trial. And I will briefly go over some of these trials in greater detail. In one phase three short-term six weeks trial, Patients, a total of 114 of them, are randomized in a two to one ratio into receiving either standard of care plus placebo versus 50 milligram of l pack. If after three weeks of treatment, the platelet count are still low, below 50,000, the l pack dose could be increased to 75 milligram. All the patients in this study they have ITP for at least six months duration, and they must have failed at least one prior ITP therapy. And their paid account at the time of entry into the study must be less than 20,000. And the end point is a paid account of greater than 50,000 at the end of the six week trial. And here is the result. Approximately 60% of the subjects receiving a trumpo pack achieve the target paid account of greater than 50,000 at the end of the six weeks treatment as compared to only 16% in the placebo group. Based on that, the Ray study was then conducted to evaluate the safety and efficacy of up to six months of treatment. The previous study was only a short-term six-week trial. The inclusion criteria were quite similar to the previous trial. Again, patients with chronic ITP longer than six months duration failed previous therapy. Baseline paid account of less than 20,000. Again, randomized in a two to one ratio into receiving a trumpo pack and starting placebo. After three weeks of treatment, like the previous trial, if the paid account was still less than 50,000, the study medication could be increased to 75 milligram. But on the other hand, if after three weeks trial, the paid account exceeded 200,000 on two the study medications could then be reduced to 25 milligram. If the patients have a satisfactory response, paid account greater than 100,000 
on two successive visits, then we can attempt to reduce or stop concomitant ITP medications. Uh, the patients will also be stratified according to whether they have spinectomy, whether they were on concomitant ITP medication, and whether their baseline pater count was less than 15,000 or not. The patients will be re followed regularly, followed the, throughout the entire six months period, and the end point is the, is the proportion of patients who had achieved a pater count between 50 and 400,000 at, at any time during the six month trial. And here is the result. Significantly, far more patients in the El Chompopec group achieved the target paid account of between 50 and 400,000 during the six month period as compared to the placebo group. It is almost an eightfold difference. In the typical responding patients, the paid account will start to increase after one week of treatment, peak by the second week, and then maintained throughout the entire study period. Following stoppage of the study medication at the end of the six month period, the paid account in most patients usually returned to the baseline level within two weeks. However, for most of the patients, the paid account just dropped back to the baseline level and not further lower. There has been always a worry with this class of drug that following the stoppage of the medication, since you remove the stimulus and also during the treatment, the endogenous thrombopoietin may also be suppressed. Therefore, if you withdraw the drug, the pater count can even drop to lower than the pretreatment level, a phenomenon of so-called rebound thrombocytopenia. But in this study, only less than 10% of the patients have the so-called rebound thrombocytopenia. If you look at the patients receiving placebo, similar percentage of around 10% have rebound thrombocytopenia. Therefore, in this brief study, we did not observe increased such incidence. The improvement in the paid account was accompanied by a significant reduction in the bleeding symptoms. At the end of the six-month trial, when the study medication was stopped, most patients, the bleeding symptoms returned to the baseline level, but again, no worse than before. If you look at the ability to have concomitant ITP medications reduced, significantly higher proportion of patients in the El Chompopec group, nearly 60%, as compared with only 30% of them, were able to reduce or discontinued concomitant ITP medication. Steroids was the medication most commonly discontinued. In most cases in the placebo group, the reason for discontinu discontinuing concomitant ITP medication was not because of efficacy, but because of the side effects of the concomitant ITP medication. We also look at the ability to reduce the use of rescue therapy. What is rescue therapy? If at any one time during the six-month trial, a subject requires paid transfusion, increase in the dose of the concomitant ITP medication, or required the addition of a new concomitant ITP medication, the patient is defined as requiring rescue therapy. And as shown here, Significantly higher proportion of patients in the placebo group, 40% of them, required rescue therapy as compared to only 18% in the Echumpopec group. We also look at the impact of the therapy on the quality of life. At regular interval during the study, the patients will be given a questionnaire to assess okay, the quality of life. And as shown here, patients receiving Echumpopec, significantly more of them shown an improvement in the quality of life, namely in physical function, physical role, vitality, social function, emotional role, and overall mental and physical status. The extent study was then conducted, this time to e evaluate even longer term safety and efficacy. The extent study is an open label study all subjects who have participated in previous El Chompopec trial, whether they received placebo or the actual drug, will be eligible, provided they do not have any significant adverse effects from the previous trial. 
In the extensive date, in the first phase, they will all started on a triple pack 50 milligram daily. The dose is then adjusted to the lowest amount able to keep a paid account greater than 100,000. In the second stage, those on concomitant ITB medication will have their concomitant ITB medication reduced or even discontinued to the lowest amount able to maintain the paid account greater than 50,000. In the third stage, the trumpopec dose will be further titrated to the lowest amount again able to maintain a paid account greater than 50,000. And then the subject will be followed for long term in terms of safety and efficacy. About nearly 90% of the patients in the extent study have a response with a paid account greater than 50,000. And like in the previous RAID study, the response was similar irrespective of the baseline paid account, whether the subjects were on concomitant ITP medications or whether they had splenectomy or not. In the extent study, we are interested in several adverse events. One of them is hepatobiliary abnormalities. If you look at all the studies conducted with a pack, including EXTEND, the RACE, and the previous short-term trial, approximately about 10% of the subjects experience hepatobiliary laboratory abnormalities with elevated bilirubin, elevated liver enzymes, etc. But fortunately, for nearly all of these patients, those liver abnormalities are transient and reversible. In many of them, the hepatobiliary laboratory abnormalities, the raised serum liver enzymes and bilirubin returned to normal level while the subject still continued on the drug. And in a, the other remaining fraction, they returned to normal following stoppage of the drug. Therefore, in the extent study and in the previous a trumpopec trial, there was no evidence of a permanent liver damage. Interestingly, some of the subjects who had experienced hepatobiliary abnormalities in the RAID study, and when they entered the extent trial and be challenged with a trumpopec, those liver abnormalities did not recur. Therefore, so far the data suggested that it is safe in terms of hepatic toxicity for most patients. But nonetheless, we do recommend that for patients that have liver damage, we start on a lower dose and monitor the liver function very carefully. The other adverse event of concern is the risk of thromboembolism. Patients with ITP, some people argue that they also have an underlying increased risk of thrombosis. And if you raise the paid account in this group of patients, you may enhance the development of thromboembolic event. If you combine all the trombopec studies, the extend, the previous raise, etc., a total of 23 out of 448 patients, 5.1% of them, experience thromboembolic event while on a trumpopec. Deep brain thrombosis is the commonest, followed by pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarction, and ischemic stroke. Interestingly, there was no association of the thromboembolic event with the paid account. And for the majority of the patients, the thromboembolic event occurred at the paid account much lower than the maximum level experienced by the patient. In over 90% of them, it occurs at much lower than the maximum level. And in over 50% of them, the thromboembolic event occurs at a paid account of less than 100,000. In some patients, the thromboembolic event occurs while the patients still have a very low paid account, like 10,000 or 20,000. There was no correlation at all with the degree of the elevation of the paid account. And also, if you compare the overall incidence of 5.1% of thromboembolic event in patients with receiving a pack with those reported in the general ITP population, it is no higher. According to the US and the UK database, approximately 6.1 to 6.9% of the subjects with ITP experienced thromboembolic event. 
And for patients on a triple pack, the overall incidence is 5.1%. So it is no higher. If you look at all the patients who develop thromboembolic events while on a triple pack therapy, all these patients have at least one or more risk factors for thromboembolism, namely underlying hypertension on oral contraceptive pills, prolonged hospitalizations without prophylactic anticoagulation, surgery, underlying malignancy. All of them had underlying risk factor. We also, in some patients, look for thrombophilia screen, and only in two out of the 15 patients, we noted a heterozygous mutation for the factor V latent. And also, there is no relationship between the duration of a pack therapy and the onset of the thromboembolic event. In some subjects, the thromboembolic event occurred after the patient was started on a pack when the beta count was still less than 20,000. While on, in some subjects, the thromboembolic e event occurred after nearly three years of treatment with a stable beta count of around 50 or 60,000. So in view of the fact that there was no relationship of the thromboembolic event with the beta count, with the duration of therapy, the fact that all the patients that have thromboembolism had underlying risk factor and the overall incidence was no higher than that reported in the general ITP population, the data so far did not suggest an increased risk of thromboembolism with a pack. But nonetheless, for patients that have underlying risk factor, we do advise starting the drug cautiously, starting at a lower dose, and monitoring the beta count very carefully, aiming at the minimum beta count that is adequate to stop the bleeding. The other worry is whether this class of drug can increase the incidence of myelofibrosis. During the extent study, there were over 180 on-treatment bone marrow biopsies. And some patients, in 39 of them, we have serial bone marrow biopsies. Overall, only 12 patients had myelofibrosis, reticulant grade, score 2 or below. None have myelofibrosis, grade 3 or above. And of these 12 patients, none of them had any abnormalities in the peripheral blood like teardrops or nucleated RBC. These patients also have cytogenetic studies performed, and none of them revealed a clonal abnormalities. And for the 39 patients who have serial biopsies, there was only one case of progression from myelofibrosis grade 1 to grade 2. No cases of progression to grade 3 or beyond. On the other hand, two patients, they have a decrease in the myelofibrosis grade from grade 2 to zero or grade 1 to 0 while on therapy. The follow-up period is still quite short. The maximum follow-up is about 4 years, but so far the data did not suggest an increased risk of myelofibrosis with l pack. Just a few words about the other thrombopoietin receptor agonists, vomipostine or M-plate. Unlike l pack, which is a small molecule taken orally, vomipostine is a fusion protein consisting of the constant region of the immunoglobulin gene linked to a thrombopoietin receptor binding domain. It has no sequence homology with the endogenous thrombopoietin. It is given subcutaneously, usually as a weekly dose. It binds to the extracellular region of the thrombopoietin receptor. On the other hand, a pack binds to the transmembrane region. Like a pack, numerous studies have been conducted with vomipostine, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, extended study, etc. And this is a summary of the result. Again, it demonstrates efficacy, ability to reduce concomitant ITP medications, and general overall safety. The following few slides is just a summary of these two drugs, a pack and vomipostine. It is not meant to be a head-to-head -head comparison of the two drugs, as there is no study having been conducted compare these two drugs directly. So they are just summarizing them from the published data. As mentioned before, one is a non-peptide, one is a peptide body, oral daily dose, subcutaneous daily dose. For l pack, 
Usually, for responding patients, you will see the paid count to start to increase after one week of treatment, peak by the second weeks, and maintained throughout the study. For Bombay-Postin, it usually starts to increase the paid count one to two weeks after treatment, peak between the second and four weeks. Overall efficacy, if you look at all the published trials, are quite similar, between 60 to 80 percent. Ability to reduce concomitant ITP medication, they are quite similar, about in 50 percent of the subjects. Able to reduce clinical bleeding in up to 80 percent of the subjects. If you look at side effects, both drugs, okay, in some patients, the platelet may overshoot, you have thrombocytosis, but from those patients, if you stop the drug, the platelet count promptly returns to the normal range, and those overshoot were not accompanied by thromboembolic event. If you look at overall incidence of thrombosis, around 5% with each drug, no higher than that in the general ITP population. Both of them did not cause platelet activation. One worry is whether this kind of drug can stimulate production of autoantibodies against the native thrombopoietin for l pack because it is a small molecule. So far, there is no evidence of autoantibody production. For romipostin, there was only one case of anti-romipostin antibodies, but no case of anti-thrombopoietin antibodies. For marrow fibrosis for l pack so far, there was no firm evidence to suggest that it may promote myelofibrosis. In the romance posting, there is still ongoing study, and so far the data again did not indicate an increased risk. Rebound from cytopenia, so far there is no strong evidence that this actually occurred. So overall summary, if you compare the two drugs, Revolate or Mplate, to me, being a diehard tennis fan, it is like comparing Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic. They are so close, okay? The two of them shared the last eight Grand Slam, each winning four of them, and they battle for six hours before you, you see a minor difference. So, of course, there are minor differences. One is left-handed, one is right-handed. Just like one is given orally, one is given subcutaneously. Your choice is your own preference, whether you are diehard Nadal fans or you are diehard Djokovic fans. So the role of the thrombopoietin receptor agonist, the most obvious indication will be for chronic ITP patients who underwent splenectomy and who are recurrent or who are still refractory to current therapy, or in those patients in whom splenectomy is either contraindicated or the patients refuse. If you look at the ASH guidelines, okay, the recommend or the international consensus guidelines, thrombopack Bumipostin or the thrombopoietin receptor agonist will be recommended okay, for patients okay, who have splenectomy or for patients who have phase 1 therapy and who had not a splenectomy if they are contra or if splenectomy is contraindicated or in whom splenectomy is being refused. For me in Hong Kong, this is the treatment algorithm. Okay. For patients that have ITP, pay the count less than 30,000, that's requiring treatment, the first-line therapy, as mentioned by the previous speaker, is still steroids. For patients that have failed steroids, we may recommend spinectomy. But for patients in whom spinectomy failed, who refused, or in whom spinectomy is contraindicated, there will be a role for the thrombopoietin receptor agonist. There are still some issues remain to be decided what should be the starting dose for this kind of reagent? For l pack, if you look at the insert, the usual starting dose, recommended starting dose, is 50 mg. But because of the pharmacokinetic studies in the East Asian subjects, it is recommended that 25 mg is the starting dose. In Japan, they may even recommend 12.5 mg as the starting dose. But there will be, our local data show that a lot of our patients the final effective dose is actually 50 mg or above. But the key point about okay, using this class of drug, as shown by the pharmacokinetic curve, if you start the drug, you should expect a response by about two weeks in the responder. So if you don't see a response after two to three weeks of treatment, you may contem contemplate increasing the dose. On the other hand, if you see a response and the beta count rose well above 100, you may start to taper the dose. The aim, again, is like most drugs, 
the lowest dose able to maintain an effective paid account. The other issue will different from proportion receptor agonists work in different patients. If you fail one, will the patients respond to another? There is some anecdotal evidence suggest that it may happen. The other issue is, will the two drugs have additive or synergistic effects? They bind to different regions of the thrombopoietin receptor, so there may be a possibility that in some patients you may have additive or synergistic effect. Will thrombopoietin receptor agonists need to be given indefinitely? Can some patients have a long-term remission after a short course of treatment? There are data that a few patients, after treatment with a brief course of thrombopac, they have a long remission. The reason, because in laboratory data, like mentioned by the previous speaker, from proportion receptor agonist may affect the regulatory T cells. Therefore, some patients may have a prolonged remission with treatment of this class of drug. What will be the long-term toxicity of continuous treatment? We still need further data. I'm going to stop here. Thank you.